All right. Hi, everybody. Uh, today, I got the privilege of finally getting Dr. Salman Farid with me on a Zoom interview right now. And hopefully, uh, you will see this posted on, uh, on, your, on my YouTube channel. And thank you, Dr. Salman, for coming. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be on. Thank you. Okay, and for the people who don't know Dr. Sulman Farhat is, he's actually, let me start off from here. Uh, he gave his USMLE step one in, in 2009 or 10, doctor? Uh, 2010. Yeah, and you scored 259 in your step one, 250 in your step two, and 230 in your step three, approximately, if I'm right. I guess so. Right. And right now you're going for your intervention cardiology? Yes. Right. Okay. And before that, uh, Dr. Sulman is originally from Pakistan. I know him from there uh, from various different reasons from a very long time. He even taught me how to neck while in BDS. So that's also a privilege, I would say. And one of the reasons I have him because he's... Uh, I would say one of the geniuses I came across who has some, I would say unique capabilities to go through his academic record like nobody else I've seen from Pakistan. Just to give you an overview of his previous academic rec record, he did his MBBS from King Edward, which is one of the best schools, medical schools in whole of Pakistan or I would say subcontinent. He also got admission in Aga Khan University during his MBBS. He holds a record in all levels of nine A's. Uh, he was he stayed from St. Anthony's High School while I was also a student up there. And I still remember when he broke that record. In A levels, he did it from HSN, uh, HSN College, right? Uh, and had four A's in that. And this was back in 2002, if I'm correct. And beside that, he worked in... Canada as a researcher, then he moved to US, got internal medicine residency in Edmonton Jefferson Hospital. Uh, he worked as a chief fellow journal cardiology fellowship you did from Mew Clinic and now you're going for the intervention cardiology. So that was a long bio and correct me if I'm wrong at any place, Dr. Suman. No, thank you so much for the glowing introduction of the real and uh, like you said, you know, me and Israel go way back. Like we sort of grew up together in the same neighborhood and went to the same school. And then I, 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 I saw you go through dental school and achieve all these successes. So really proud of you. Thank you, thank you. You, uh, well, yes, I act. I would say I grew up looking at you because you were a friend of my elder brother. So I had a lot of like, okay, so. Coming to the point, one of the reasons I have Dr. Salman up here because he was able to achieve a lot of things that not many people from his background or from, like I come from the same place as a, as a Pakistani student, the amount of records you broke and this education you did, and you're still going on to continue with your education as a intervention cardiologist. What pursued you to do all of this like, what's the what's the reason behind this? Uh, so, uh, really, to be honest with you, I, mean, I never, uh, I never sought to, you know, go as oh, yeah, I want to break records or do the highest uh, uh, marks in whatever exams. I don't even remember. It was a long time ago, but I do remember that I really enjoyed. I I was extremely passionate about uh, medicine in general, and then later on when I went into cardiology and now interventional cardiology. Just something that I enjoy doing a lot and something like everyone has different gifts. Some people are good at one thing versus another. I, I felt that this is where um, I felt where my uh, uh, ability are. And also just because I enjoyed and I wanted to, for example, in my initial stages, I wanted so bad to uh, get a residency in the U.S. That, that pushed me to work hard to get the... Uh, marks required to be selected as a resident. Then once I was a resident, I wanted to be a good physician. I wanted to, uh, and part of being a good physician is to have the knowledge required. So, so, you know, that pushed me to read more, learn more about the specialty, stay updated, uh, and same thing about clinical skills. And that's also true now that, you know, now I'm moving more into a specialty and a subspecialty, 
the getting better at the procedures that I, that I do um, is, uh, you know, it's something that gives me joy and something that I'm very passionate about. And I think that whatever you really enjoy doing, um, it's easy to work hard at that. And, I, you know, I think I would say that for everyone applying for dental school, medical school, uh, I think it's a, it's a field where you have to work really hard. It's, it's, it makes it easier if you enjoy doing it. So one question, how many match have you applied until now? Oh, way too many. No. <laughs> so I, for internal medicine match uh, 2013, uh, 2012, 2013, and I applied for cardiology match. Now the most recent last one was interventional cardiology, uh, structural heart disease match. So three how, match how, how many matches were you accepted at when you were applying for internal medicine and then for later on? So the, uh, for us, the way the match process worked is you, you get interviews from different programs. So I interviewed at like, several different programs. And then you uh, submit a rank order list. And look, this is the first choice, second choice, third choice. Um, so Abington Jefferson was my first choice. Uh, and then uh, eventually, you, you get. that's why it's called a match. You get matched to program where you like the program and the program likes you. Uh, fortunately, I ended up at my first option for internal medicine. Uh, so, but it, it, you only get one uh, final match. Right. Right. Different yeah. Different. The reason I ask is that after people do DDS and if they want to apply for post-grad residencies like in sur oral surgery, in orthodontics, they have the same match program. So what's your, what would you suggest about the whole, since you've been a chief resident as well, you've taken interviews, you have seen how it functions. What's the, how does this match works? Like how is it functioning? So uh, my suggestion for applicants would be to just, um, you know, there's several priorities for different people. Like for me, Green Card was a priority. Abington was the only program which offered Green Card, but also you want to see you know, if the program has a good name. You want to see the quality of training. You know, believe it or not, the program that you train at stays with you for life. You know, the kind of training that you get initially is extremely important and the name will stick with you for life. Um, I think it's important to assess all of these things and then um, for some people, geograph uh, being close to family is important. If you have family in a certain areas, for some people, that may be the priority. Um, uh, and also, you want to be happy there. So, you know, if it's a program which is, uh, which is friendly and you think that you'll get along with the, with the attendings and the other residents there, I think that's also an important factor because in order to learn, you have to be comfortable, you have to be happy. All of these things go into the decision-making of picking a program. From the other end, um, in terms of uh, when the programs picking candidates, I've been on that side of the interview process as well. So um, I think a lot of, for the initial um, filter process, the, the, a lot of programs look at USMLE scores, uh, maybe similar for DDS as well. A lot of programs look at your USMLE scores to filter candidates that they'll invite for interviews. And so, you know, try your best to get a good score. It certainly maximizes your chances of getting more interviews. Um, and then uh, they also look at uh, uh, your application as a whole, if this publication matter, your interview skills are important. For someone who's needs to work with, that's obviously all of these things are important. They also want to get a sense of how interested you are in the program. So if you're if I'm interviewing someone and I get uh, a gut sense that, you know, he doesn't really want to be there, I wouldn't rank that person high. So, you know, try to show interest. You can do that by asking appropriate questions. You can do that by staying in touch with the program. A lot of things, all, and all of these small things add up. Because when you're interviewing candidates, you interview like maybe uh, 100 candidates and all of them are excellent. So it's just it's these small things which make a big difference. Now, exactly how the program matches the you know nobody really understands it's, it's it was an, it's a computer algorithm which was 
designed by a mathematician uh John Nash I don't know if you've seen the movie Beautiful Minds that's that yeah, the guy yeah 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 he was the person who designed the algorithm behind the match nobody really knows how, what happens behind the scenes but it seems to work i mean eventually most people end up in a program they like and the programs end up with a candidate they can live with so the match algorithm was designed by don nash yes really wow wow okay okay yeah. that, that's right so the 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 way i look at it is the future of a lot of doctors and dentists is being set by a mathematicians algorithm right now <laughs> that, yeah, yeah. but one of the things you said is by asking appropriate questions during your interview by the program now this is something fascinating to me because it happens the same in the dental uh, realm as well and the thing is people have a hard time understanding appropriate questions because uh, when i talk to candidates and you you've dealt with so many candidates as a resident being one of them and being an interview as well they might ask you questions which you will feel are not very appropriate in the way that they are just going to ask you something which they already read on the website yeah and they are just asking you for the sake of talking to you and you know this right away you see through this that this person hasn't met anybody from the program hasn't visited philadelphia or the abingdon hospital he's just asking for the sake of asking so in your experience what is an appropriate question during the interviews so that's a really good question and you know believe it or not asking good questions is not easy you have to do research on the program and like you said it's real it's not just um, you know asking things which are already listed on the program so i found that you know if you talk to the current residents or if you know someone who's been to that program um giving them a call ahead of time really helps because then they can they can tell you what the strengths of the programs are and what the weaknesses of the program are like for example at abington um you know Uh, it, it it helps if you ask specific questions like for example abington had a elvad or left ventricular assist device program in combination with jefferson so you know you can say hey i'm interested in heart failure or cardiology and i've heard that you have a really good elvad program what kind of exposure do, does that offer to resident it shows that you know you you know specifics about the program it's not just like a generic question and but also it has to be genuine you know if, if you are otherwise saying that you know you want to do gastroenterology and you're asking about an elvad question or you know a cardiology question it will probably come off as insincere or you know you could interview mm-hmm. you it so you have to show a genuine interest something that they think that you know you would be interested in and something which is specific to the program sometimes you can also ask questions like uh, uh you know what do you think uh, is the best thing about this program i i like to usually when i'm interviewing at a program i like to uh focus more on the positives rather than the negatives it's natural to the positives as good rather than asking them okay where uh, you know if for example if you the community program asking them about basic science research would not be a good question that's something that they cannot offer there makes sense makes sense yeah so just to rephrase what you said is asking positive thing about the program don't ask them something that they don't have for example yeah. if they don't have a machinery on mri and you're asking do you have that that's not a very good place secondly uh, talking and researching with the current residents or people who have graduated from there so knowing the system from within helps yes so from your experiences as an interviewer and an in- interviewee what have you which was the most difficult question that you have ever dealt or heard with mm, so the one so one of the questions which is very common uh and on the surface it sounds easy but it's also sort of a little challenging to answer is tell me more about yourself it's a very open question it sort of invites you to drive the interview um so even though it's a very simple basic generic question like tell me about yourself but it takes some 
thought and some planning so because you know if someone asks you this question it pretty much directs to whichever direction you wanted like you know a lot of people start answering this question by giving them the whole uh and you know, uh my experience is that after half a minute or one minute the interviewer would lose interest so what i used to do is i just I focus on things that i want the interview to uh, be mostly around um, and you know that could be on your hobbies it could be on so your research project it could be on your future interests but whatever you answered in this question will probably be the the theme of the rest of the interview So I think it's even though it's a simple question, it's a difficult one to really answer well, uh, so that it goes well for you in your interview overall. I remember when I talked to you when I was preparing for my dental school interviews about this question, and I I remember like the one of the things that I've learned, and I'm rephrasing you right now. What you said is try to it's just like why was you drag them towards the places you're strong at. So if I'm strong at uh, for example in oral surgery i want to dictate that side of my personality or if i'm good at basketball i'm just saying i will try to pin that in during my conversation so it's kind of like you have to dictate where you're taking them and i hope that how it was in the vivas as well you never say something that you're not aware of so that's that's some really positive uh, i would say advice for a lot of people so one other thing is people coming from india pakistan are most of them from healthcare backgrounds are really good with their when it comes to studying passing their exams they try their best to kind of get good scores but beside this we don't do volunteer work up there most of us don't like unless you have been affiliated with an organization that is non profit or a religious organization you still have that mentality or you still dealt with volunteer work but, but what else should people be considering while applying to programs like except for exams it's so uh, volunteer work is very important like you pointed out and there's there's so many opportunities for volunteer work uh, for us, a lot of us back home but also once to come here volunteer work is relatively fine but also um, i've i've noticed that there is more and more uh, emphasis on research that having someone who has some research background makes them extremely hireable um you know this is something that i wish that i did more of when i was uh, in the application stage if you have for example a masters degree with statistics background that's a skill which is highly sought after Really? No matter, yeah. So no matter which specialty you go to, if you have some basic knowledge, like if people who have an MPH degree or if someone who understands the basic research methodology, because a lot of physician and dentists don't understand statistics and they need it for to complete the research projects. Even if they have one person in their group or in their residency who. is good at statistics he will be everyone's favorite because everyone will be coming with their research projects and asking for your help so i think that's that's another thing which is a huge plus in your application being good uh, with communication is essential because um, as 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 medical professionals communication is something which you know you you can't be too good at you have to it's it's a people you deal with people every day so you have to be good at communication both with your peers with your patients uh so if you know at that stage if you can work on being a better communicator that will help you not only in interviews but also in your career going forward um other things which help is having experience in the west like you know doing observerships or externships whatever you can get the you know us experience um adds to your cv as well so you said communication and i was thinking about this since we now have to write a lot of notes as you guys you have to you spend so much time writing notes now and they say this is one of the most litigious country in the world us is anybody could sue you right away and people are looking to sue doctors all the time so communication writing your notes is is very important and i 
I've learned this like during interviews, if you say that you have some kind of awareness about laws like HIPAA, OSHA, patient confidentiality, softwares, they actually like you much more as a candidate. So that has also been a been something that have been very productive. Uh, so you said uh, one of the one of the things that I know about you that before coming to US, you actually moved to Canada and you worked there and did some research. Can you talk about your experience in Canada before you moved to US? Absolutely. So, so this was right after I finished medical school. And so between medical school and when I was preparing for USMLE, I used that downtime to get familiar with the basic research uh, process. So um, I, uh, I went to, and you know, this is another example of how you can find opportunity. So I went to University of, uh, of Manitoba and you know, I, I started emailing people and meeting with them in person. I think, hey, I've just finished medical school. I would love to volunteer for any research. And eventually I was able to get into research lab of, of a, it was a very active research lab which were, were working in Alzheimer's disease, mouse models. I got to work on PCR, um, and, uh, you know, we did a lot of experiments on mouse models of Alzheimer's disease. Mm-hmm. They were genetically mutated mice and we would test different drugs. So even though I ended up not going into neurology or Alzheimer's, but the skills that I learned, like how to run a PCR, how to do a basic science uh, lab, how to collect data, how to run a basic statistical analysis, write an abstract, present a research project. All of these were skills which would very easily, which could very easily be translated into internal medicine or uh, cardiology or interventional cardiology. And adds to your CV, um, it, it looks good on your CV, and I, I think it's very useful skill to have because these days, in dentistry or in medicine, you can't separate research from from uh, just clinical work. You have to have some basic understanding of research. So how were you, like, okay, th- this is a very important question uh, because people after dentistry who want to go into oral surgery have to give CBSCs. So that's just the same version of step one. How were you managing recently migration to Canada, which is very cold? And you're coming from a different culture like Pakistan, adjusting to it. Then you're studying, you're doing research, and most probably you had to do other stuff to survive in a place like Canada. So how were you studying at this time? How did you manage all this stuff? It, it's it's hard. You have to divide time, and it's you know it's, it's obviously it's not an easy skill to um, balance you know, work, research, time, studying. But it's something that you have to do, not just for USMLE, but also, you know, this going um, as even as, as you advance further in your career. Um, so there's actually several books that you can read on how to be time management. I'll be honest with you, I haven't mastered time management yet, but still working on it. Uh, but I would encourage you, you know, for someone um, who has time to read or, you know, listen to audiobooks. I think this is one area which you can learn to be more effective. And everyone has different strategies. Like for me personally, I would uh, I would study mostly at night and then spend the day hours in research. Uh, and you can even divide days, you can do like, you know, a couple of times of, a week of research and the rest of time for studying. Um, but, you know, there's no way around it. You have to put in put in the work. What did you say? Study at night and then uh, use your daytime to sleep, you said? Daytime to do research or, yeah. So when did you sleep? <laughs> I wasn't studying all night, of course. But uh, you, know, it's, you have to, because I, I think if you only if you only study for USMLE and you're not doing anything else, then it's hard to... Um, uh, it's hard to justify the time off because they will ask you what you were doing during that time. So you have to show something. Like if there, were, there was times when I was going to the research lab two or three times a week and using the rest of the time to study. But at least I had something to show during these months I was doing research. 
So, or in volunteer work. So, yeah, it's important to not leave too many gaps in your CV. Makes sense. I, and uh, what, you might know this better. I have actually dealt with the female candidates. They are usually asked a lot of this time and cause of being uh, put, like maternity leaves and these kind of situation. Have you dealt with this during your interview where they ask, especially women, that you have a gap like, is that something part of the culture and norm and the and the programs know that, okay, people, women who are married and have kids usually take gap during their uh, programs or during their studies? So, um, I mean, of course, people understand that if, if, uh, that if, you, if you need a gap for family purposes, it's obviously understandable. But when, when you come back after the gap, you would have to do some U.S. experience, some clinical experience, some research to show that you're still active and you remember, um, you know, your your knowledge. So for someone who has to take a gap for family purposes, of course, life is important. So you can't, um, you, you know, life gets in the way. Sometimes you have to, for one reason or some, or some other reason, sometimes you have to take a gap and there's no way around it. But... Um, a good advice for someone like this is to maybe once you're ready to come back to work, uh, get some U.S. clinical experience. And this way you'll be active again. And if the gap is in the past, then it doesn't matter as much. Uh, if you're interviewing at the time when you're still in gap and the last time you had any clinical contact with two, was two years ago, that might be, uh, might be a problem for successfully matching. And one thing I've learned this and... Okay, the roots of this goes back to the whole culture. I've seen one thing in US, even their literature, their movies. Okay, if you talk about your failure and you tell like, okay, this time I had a problem in my life. I was broke, I had illness, I had death, I have failed, but I got back up and I'm much stronger than it is. US likes that a lot. And one of my cousins, he told me that if you're 50 years old and you want to go to Harvard, it will let you go. Like the system allows you. But in other countries which were a part of a colony or even England, if you're 23, you get into Oxford, you're good. Otherwise, you're too old to get in. So the, I, I believe the, the system does, yes, it does beat the hell out of you. Because uh, one of the things I want to question you is I met a resident from anesthesia and an anesthesiologist. And he was saying, oh, our good weeks uh, are approximately like 70 hours a week. That's a good week for us. But it can even go higher than this. How do you, and let me tell people who are outside of US, when you're working 60, 70 hours in US, it means you're working full on. Like there's no sleep, there's no time to talk and drink. Like they put you on a treadmill 24, 24 seven. So how do you manage this, this kind of workload? And you're living in hospital, you're sleeping in hospital, you pretty much go home, change and come back. How do you manage yeah. this? So good, good question. And you know, there's, there has been increasingly more awareness about position burnout. Because working long hours can be hard and you, you need you need breaks. You need, it's usually like, you know, more than 80 hours is the work hour limit. If you're working more than eight hours, burned out. You're working too much, and that makes you prone to make more errors. So I I, I think uh, there's a, there's a fine balance between being efficient, the overwork. You have to be efficient, and if you're working like less than thirty hours a week, you're probably not doing enough. But if you're working more than eighty hours, you you may be burned out, and you you may not be as efficient. So now in the past, like if you if you talk to physicians who were like 20 years older than us, they literally used to live in the hospital. That's why they were called residents. And then they would go home like once a week. But that culture is starting to change in our generation. And we still work hard, but not as hard as people who worked like 20 years ago. Um, and uh, I mean, especially a lot of the physician uh, committees are emphasizing making workflow easier for us by you know having um, computers or scribes to work uh, to help making the uh, notes easier to write 
uh, so that you know we, we don't we don't have to spend that much time doing documentation. Uh, but it's still hard work. I mean, so that's why, like I said initially, you have to like what you do, otherwise you will get burnt out. You have to enjoy. You have to find purpose in what you are doing. So one of the things that, and I kind of understand this, like when you're young and foolish, you hit your limits. Like anything you do, you go overly passionate about it. Just like it could be anything. And then you hit your limits and you figure out, okay, that's where I find my neck pain, my back pain, or uh, something like that. You see your limitations and then you go back and find your sweet spot. So, okay, after 80 hours, I, I'm, I'm going suicidal now. So I need to go back to 60. Like you revert back to a sweet spot. So what was you, what's your ideal ideal limit to kind of where you can get good sleep and have a balanced life and st- even studying, like you need to keep up with yourself, with your literature, but the, if you don't have sleep, you can't, it, it feels like ants on paper. Well, I, I, I'm like most other people in our profession, we're mostly like type A personalities and we want to you know, work more and, um, Working a lot and being productive is good, but at the same time, like you alluded to, like this is the marathon; it's not a sprint. You have to make sure that you're healthy. You have to make sure that you're not overdoing it to a point that you can't do it anymore. So you know, as I'm as I'm getting uh, more, uh, as I'm getting older and more as PGY nine or ten, I'm starting to try to pace myself rather than. Or just do everything and be more enthusiastic and take out take on a lot of projects and study research projects. There is this work life balance is important and then work work balance is also important. You want to continue doing this long term. Something to be mindful about. You said work work balance. That's a quite a new thing. I've heard about work life balance, but this is a new thing for me. Work work balance. What is that? Everyone talks about work-life balance, so, you know, and work-life balance by itself is also tough. You, know? you have to, at some point, if you're not spending enough time with your family, you won't be happy down the line. So you have to, uh, when you are at home, spending time with family. At least for me, I have to learn to I have to be mindful to do that. But the second part, work work balance is you know, work is not for us. Like work is not just you know, being in the office seven to seven. There's several aspects of work. There's patient care, there's uh, academics, there's research, there's uh, teaching with other people, um, and uh, uh, and so forth. And you know, it's patients in clinic versus doing procedures, or uh, versus there will be some aspects of work that you'll enjoy more. There will be some aspects of work that you won't enjoy as much. So if you're doing too much, for example, patient care, you ignore your academics, reading, or you'll ignore um, doing more research. If you're doing research all the time, you won't be as good in clinical skills and procedures. So, you know, I've, it's, recently I've realized that it's important, even within the work, to you know, have a balance of what you are doing to be more satisfied with your career. Okay. That's not what it's about. Okay. But that's how I down the line. Let me summarize this. In between, when you tilt your head, I think the mic catches less voice, but you're saying within your work, if you have several fields, I'm going to go back to, I'm going to revert to dentistry. Like, okay, if I like extracting tooth rather than doing orthodontics, so I tried doing more and more, and that's our human psyche. Like we try to revert towards things that we are good at and run away from the things that we are weaker. So you're saying we should keep a balance between all the things that we are doing. That's what you're saying? Absolutely. But even in, uh, can you hear me better now? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So even the, you know, as you said, extracting, extracting teeth, so you like extractions better, but with the, there may be different procedures, but just doing procedures is not all of your career. It's also, you know, learning, um, staying up to date about current practices, but also maybe, you know, at some point developing new techniques or uh, contributing to research. So all of that, you know, it also needs time, right? So um, same thing for us, like you have to read. I'm 
there is some administrative component to our jobs as well so you know staying on on track of paperwork administrative work that's also important responding to patient messages um uh teaching other residents or junior junior residents all of that is also it's our work is not just being a tactician and just uh, you know doing extractions or doing procedures or like for me like just doing heart catheterization is not all of her job so you have to be mindful of other aspects of our our career as well that makes sense that makes a lot of sense and people who are still considering for professions and haven't entered dentistry or medical let me tell you something the life of a general dentist is comparatively way more balanced as compared to healthcare workers uh, as compared to doctors in the hospital and i i'm actually okay one of the reasons i wanted to talk to you is when i see when i'm i actually talked to a oral surgery resident and i think he got into uh in michigan detroit and he was telling me they asked him a question this is a fun one that if you were a pg1 and your senior resident is with you during the night and a trauma comes in and you figure out that your senior pg is drunk what will you do at that time so first of all i would like to hear your answer how would you deal with that oh that, that's a tough one but obviously that the right thing to do is to you have to even though it's a, it's a tough situation um you have to you are legally liable to report him i would you know confront him first just to make sure if he's really drunk but as hard as it is you have to do the right thing and and i would i would report him to my supervisor and you will you're sort of legally bound to report that to the board as well okay and the second thing i was talking to him and he was saying that okay in the start the and this is what you sign up for but you're going to be working like 70 to 80 hours a week and then you have to give your cbsc usmle part 1 as a dentist now you're doing it part 1 part 2 and they make you even do some programs make you do md for 2 years and even that it varies what kind of training they will give you in md it might be something that's very hands on or it could be just going through the didactic part and getting an md and you're good enough so even that varies but i was just considering that that's a very lo- like if i have to do it back when i was 24 that still makes sense because you're kind of young and energetic but how is it is it just a passion okay i believe if i'm passionate about something it takes me about 50 hours through a week but after 50 hours i'm actually cursing myself like wait because at some point when you're sleepless you're hungry and you have workload even your passion kind of walks out the room and leave you on your own so how what what's the i'm trying to understand what drives what's the mind setup of a person who's working 60 hours studying have family and it's pretty much like it's a very sacrificial kind of profession because in us even if you want to make money just do an amazon business you can like do anything else be a but what drives that whole mentality so you know i have to say that you know, of course if you're working very hard on a busy day you will be tired that just means that you're 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 working uh but you know i have to say if you if you're working so much that you feel miserable you're probably not doing the right thing you know that's that's not what it's meant to feel like if you there's got to be doing something wrong if you if at the end of the day on a weekend if you come back and say hey what have i signed up for that probably, if if that's if you feel like that you probably just probably rethink you know what you signed up for but for most people medicine or not medicine i mean working hard should be the kind of working hard that afterward makes you feel good like you know when they, like it really work out right so like when, when you're at a gym your muscles are sore it hurts maybe for a time being but when you're done you're like oh that was a good workout i think work should feel the same way it should you know when you when you're when you're busy you may be 
uh, it may you may be sore a little bit, but when you come home at the end, you should feel good about yourself. You know, maybe I made a difference in a patient's life. Maybe someone um, had. Um, you have to find your why. Is it? It's you know you have to, and that that's what I think uh, makes all the work worth it. Is if you know why you're doing it in the first place, um, and and. Uh, for a lot of people, it it may be like making a difference in other people's lives, you know, especially in healthcare. That makes sense. So, coming, coming. So I'm switching gears now. So the other side is I remember like when at least from Pakistan, you used to play basketball. You were in swimming. You did horse riding. So what what about now? Do you get time? any time for yourself to kind of jump into any of these activities not as much as i used to but i th- i think it's still important okay maybe i mean right now uh, in third year of fellowship is a little bit busier but certainly you know once i'm done with fellowship i certainly intend to i still love horse riding in art i still you know draw and paint on at on times i uh, i i haven't been I haven't, actually, you know, to be honest, I haven't been running or doing swimming or basketball occasionally. But I, I think it's important to try to. Maybe I'm not doing a good job at staying, uh, doing other things out out of work right now. But eventually, I think for your mental and physical uh, health and overall well-being, it's important to have some activities outside of medicine or dentistry as well. One one question that I, I totally forgot about your uh, about your hobby of painting. How do you think that fits into? So there's the doctor you, the cardiologist, and there is a part of you which is artistic, which likes to paint. How do you think that helps you become a better doctor? Does does do you see any amalgamation between them? Absolutely, I th- I think I think there's a it, it matches well because um, as an artist or someone who paints, you learn to pay attention to detail, like you know the subtle strokes, and you like to pay attention to um, for the lack of a better word, beauty or doing things well, and it it totally translates to when I'm doing a heart catheterization or I'm doing an angiogram, it's sort of like you know. It's the same sort of paying attention to getting arterial access. You know, you have to, you can get arterial access or you can get arterial access beautifully. And then you, when you're taking uh, pictures of angiograms, um, if you see like my angiograms, not that I'm showing off, but you know, there's a difference between uh, just getting a picture which is good enough or, you know, getting like, or uh, doing an angiogram which really shows each vessel separately and looks nice and there's some degree of art through there's a lot of art through that as well I and mean, it's sort of the same principles as photography so and then so even in other things like creative thinking is very important in medicine and dentistry as well so i think that if someone who has a background in art certainly there, there's a there's a big role for creative thinking, attention to detail, beauty, all of these things in medicine for sure. I'm, 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 I'm going to throw in some philosophical crap, I would say, but I've learned this from Carl Jung. He, he wrote, writes people who can paint and do artistic work like dance, music. He said this is a expression of your subconscious brain that couldn't find words for itself. So things that you cannot write or say, your brain interprets them in form of art, painting, singing. It's a, it's a personality side of you which is expressing itself in different manners, which is quite unique in its way because it makes you a 3D person. And I have a very, very tough time. This is one of the reasons I started off with the YouTube is a lot of people who come from a side of privilege or resources from countries like India and Pakistan due to cultural reasons and we were a colony and we we've been a slave for most of our like part our our culture have been we think 2d like if you're a doctor you you're supposed to think 2d but one thing i learned from from the western society especially from the people who are intellectual up here is that life is very 3d and nothing is very simple 
And since when I'm hearing a cardiologist talking about artwork, well, yeah, that makes sense. There's a lot of things that we do not contemplate while thinking about these prospects. But my other question, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm taking you back towards the Pakistan now. People who know about Pakistan would know somebody. So your your parents, both of them are medical practitioner, right? So somebody who's coming from a background whose parents are a well-known practitioner in a city like Lahore, who got education from schools like St. Anthony, HSN, King Edward. Why do you want to punish yourself through the process of migration? Because migration is a, I feel it's a time when you, you kind of lose your personality at some point because the things you grew up with do not exist in this world. Like what, what Lila, like I, I know there would be somebody listening in India or Pakistan who think like I'm good with whatever privileges I have in Pakistan. And I think somebody like you had, I would definitely say had a lot of, was blessed with a lot of privileges. So why make this gruesome migration to, to the Western country? Uh, I think the most important reason and really the only reason is that uh, the training in the United States the states is unparalleled. It, you know, training in in Pakistan or some other countries is not nearly as good as training here. You know, the sort of exposure that you get to um, to cutting edge technology. Like, there's a lot of things that I learned here, particularly in the field of cardiology. I would never have had gotten to see in Pakistan. The, the list is is long. Like you know the uh, the procedures that we do here in the cath lab, the technology, the machines that we use, the research, all of these things, you know, there's no way that I would have learned all about that, that if I'd stayed in Pakistan. There's also, I am, I think among other things that I've learned is uh, work ethic, working hard, uh, just being more efficient. And I feel that, you know, for someone who, uh, if you come here to get trained, you can always choose to go back and bring all this new knowledge and skills back to your home country. Um, and even though it takes some extra hard work, and like you said, migration is hard for anyone. It's it's not an easy transition, but it's totally worth it just because training here is so much better than you would get if you were just stayed home. So my, I'm gonna I'm I'd like to dive deeper in things. So, but I think the way you've been brought up, and I, because I've seen how you're parents invested in your education, even through a very young age, in, in all your siblings. Uh, do you think the upbringing or the mentality or the thought process they put in you regarding education, medical, and pursuing a purpose in life made you what you are today? Absolutely, no doubt about that. I mean, I know that it's, it's natural for all children to, you know, look up to their parents. And also, you know, my parents... From the, even when we were very young, they always inculcated these uh, values in us to you know to strive for the best, to uh, achieve um, your maximum potential, and they certainly you know gave us all the conditions necessary, like you said, like going to good schools, education, and um, of course they encouraged us to uh, achieve whatever you can, even if you have to. Uh, move to a different country to get that training. And I, I I could never have done it without their support. So how was it? Because I know your parents were also associated with United Christian Hospital in Lahore. And you grew up within that campus and we were neighbors at some point. So how do you think that kind of affected you or it influenced you in the medical side, your personal and professional side? Because I think both of them kind of got uh, affected by being there, living there, and seeing all that. So, ha has that been helpful in pursuing education up here? Yes, this, I mean, I saw when we were growing up in in UCH United Christian Hospital, the, we we saw a lot of physicians and and uh, other team members, a lot of missionaries who would really work hard. And I think at some level it does affect you. You know, you you think of giving back to your community as well. A lot of the people who worked at United Christian Hospital sacrificed a lot to bring back to their community. 
I mean, there were challenges as you and me both know there were there were challenges in uh in how much that was successful but i i saw the effort that a lot of people including you know your father my parents and you know we, they they made a lot of effort in trying to bring good to our community back home and what i learned from that experience it's not easy um it's you know there there may be a lot of barriers but i had a lot of respect for people who tried to do that because you know a lot of these people it, it would have been very easy to choose an easier life where they just thought about themselves and just just thought about making money making a good career instead of you know thinking about giving back to the community so i saw that in in the in the united christian hospital community uh, which uh, somehow became some part of me and, and that i i still have that uh, uh eagerness to help and some part of that may be from what i saw in uch hospital what since we are talking i'm going to you talk about the financial side i will talk about that one thing i've talked to a couple of candidates and coming from different religions some were hindu muslims and even christians who have been affiliated with missionary organizations in india and pakistan because india has a lot of hospitals and schools and colleges even seven day adventist and i actually talked to them and i said it's much more easier to get simulated and when you talk about your background which was related to these institutions because then it makes sense that you are aware of the western system you're because most of the western system is built upon judeo christian value system so even knowing how it works and what's the core value of it kind of makes you somebody that could easily be simulated in the program i know this is a hard concept for a lot of people but i try to explain this that it's not just about performing the procedure it's also about getting assimilated in the process whether you're good enough to be a team player or not so one thing i want to ask you talked about the financial side so if you didn't want to continue as a as a as a cardiologist and you just worked as a hosp- hospitalist you could have been earning much more than you don't have to do long hours how's the house and people in these countries or even in us think oh doctors make a lot of money right away like they they swim in oceans of money stuff like that but how how how's the financial aspect of continuing to study for so long is it manageable so um yeah i mean during training years you don't get paid a lot you know you only get a stipend or you can still moonlight and make some extra money but you right what does right. moonlighting mean hmm? what does uh, moonlighting so moonlighting is so when when you're a fellow like i am you already have a, like an internal medicine license so you can use your weekends to get some uh uh you could do, use your weekends to work part time and get paid extra but it's still obviously it's not um as much as a full time hospitalist would get paid um, but at some point most of us realize that it's never just about the money you know if you're in this profession for money you're in the wrong profession i mean yes we get paid well and you know it, it's i mean eventually you get get paid enough to pay bills and have a good lifestyle but um i mean when I, when i was a hospitalist uh i don't remember like it's to me it may be different for other people i think uh, uh, money is not the only thing which is a satisfaction factor in your career you have to feel good about yourself and sure everyone needs money i'm not saying that you know uh, everyone needs money to pay bills you have to support your family you you have to feed so everyone needs money and uh, if you get more money the, the more the better but it it doesn't have to be just money and uh on the off side if if you if you get too eager even in our profession i've seen people who um who want to work so much and work more get paid more and then eventually it comes to a point where they get burned out so i would encourage everyone to you know think of money as something which secondarily comes with this profession and not make it a primary objective which i know for most of us it's not yeah especially i feel when you're in a country which has a lot of material and you have a new model of tesla being released every week or every month money get prioritized but 
I felt after looking closely, medical and like especially doctors, it is a sacrificial, it's a very sacrificial profession because yeah. recently you can make similar money by going through nursing now, right? Yeah. It is, it is, and it's a very good profession. If you, if somebody is going for it, go up to NP, anesthesiologist, they can do a lot of stuff even up there. But overall, the way medical line is, I, I was talking to a friend. I, there was a reason back in England they used to call lawyers and doctors as lords' profession, because it's something like Batman that you're so rich as Bruce Wayne that now you're going out to do something else. It, it is a lords' profession because. You're sacrificing a lot. I can to totally agree with that. So not to drag this con conversation much longer. I, what if somebody is looking or looking at this video, hearing you right now in India, Pakistan, and might be a high school kid or college going or a med student, what would be your recommendation? Because you've been very focused since a young age. You came here at a young age, you're from a good background and you didn't get spoiled away that easily. You, you've you been focused and what would be your recommendation to somebody who's listening to you right now? Um, so I would say, you know, if you think that this is this profession is for you, I would say then the real would uh, second me that, you know, it's a very satisfying pro pro profession. You get a lot of respect. You you feel good about what you're doing. You have the opportunity to make a difference in other people's life and sometimes very directly. Um, and you have to work hard for it, like for anything else in life. So I, I would say, you know, keep an eye on, you know, stay focused and just, just know that it, it's all about delayed gratification. There will be times when you'll see other people or oh, everyone else is, is is already settled, they have a house and, you know, I'm still studying. But in the end, when when you finish, uh, you'll you'll be more satisfied than most people. So, I mean, that's what I would, I would say that you, if you really think that this is something for you, stay on track. Remember, it's all about delayed gratification. This is this is not a profession where you know you'll be the first one to get settled. But when you do get settled, you'll you'll enjoy life. You'll enjoy what you do, and you'll make a difference in other people's lives. One thing I, you touched upon a very good point. I, I'm sorry, I'm taking a lot of your time, but there's so much to learn from you. The point is that you said that uh, delayed gratification, and I know some people. I saw them, and they were like extraordinary. And then you look at their life, at some point they they lose it. And the I, I've seen people who don't get things that at the time when they want and they become resentful. Oh, I'm not getting a visa, or somebody got a no, you know, you came through an H1 and all that process, and later on got a green card, and you may had to make tough decisions to survive in that visa status, getting that. And then you will see somebody who get it right away. And I see people becoming resentful about somebody else getting what I don't have or what I want. How did you, del and I know you have seen, it's not like you've been winning, winning. You have went, went through your failures. You've done, I, I expect you have done a lot of difficult jobs in order to survive, even beside your medical, but not being resentful. And I've seen this personally. You're a very humble person and keep up a very positive tone in a lot of matters that I have seen you. How do you prevent yourself from not being a, not having that victim mentality or resentfulness? It's, um, uh, I, I think, you know, I've seen a lot of people who have applied with me, before me, after me. And I, I think that just like you said, people, the only people who don't eventually succeed is people who give up too soon. And it's, it's all about persistence, you know, if you keep trying, I, I know a lot of my friends who did not succeed the first time, the second time, but they kept trying, they never gave up. If you give up too soon, you'll uh, obviously not succeed. So persistence is important for anything that you do. Also, it's absolutely true here. How do you do it? Like everyone has different motivations. I think, uh, you know, just having faith, just that, you know, God has a plan for you, that also helps. 
in the in the big picture um and uh, but you you have to you have to be persistent i mean if if you're if you're not a persistent person you're more likely to give up and you're less likely to be successful that makes sense that totally makes sense the point you made a lot of people like when they i know a lot of people who are moving to the western countries are coming from privilege and if you talk anything you say the word god they would back out and act all atheist or liberal i would say in some aspect and i usually say you can't have a serious conversation without mentioning god at some point or another you can't if you're doing a therapy if you're dealing a patient who's going through some chronic illness at some point or another there's going to be a bit of a touch of spirituality in it and that's some reality that all of us figure out when we get old eventually but uh, i'm i'm more than grateful for this conversation and i hope a lot of people ask you questions all the time at the place you are you would have a video to share with them and i hope they get a lot of answers regarding you and uh, i would i'm just thank you and grateful for this for your time thank you so much israel i really enjoyed this conversation and thank you for arranging this really appreciate it